Jim Beheim had one of his careers you dream up. During his freshman year, Beheim was a walk-on with the freshman basketball team at Syracuse. By his senior year, he was the varsity team captain. He was part of a team that went 22-6 and, and earned the school's second ever NCAA tournament berth. After playing guard for Syracuse from 1963 to 66, he went on to play professionally briefly. He came back as an assistant coach in 1969, and after the team made its first ever Final Four in 1975, the head coach departed for Tulane, and Beheim would eventually be named head coach, where he stayed for the next 47 years. Remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Jim Beheim brought a level of sustainability to Syracuse that's almost unheard of. Like a years-long dynasty on college basketball 2K8 where you coach your alma mater forever. In the first 41 years as head coach at Syracuse, Beheim guided the Orange to a postseason berth either in the NCAA or NIT tournament every year which the Orange have been eligible. It wasn't until 2022 that the Syracuse actually missed a postseason, and that was actually his first ever losing season at Syracuse. During his tenure, the Orange have appeared in three NCAA National Championship games in 87, 96, and 2003, and then won the national title in 2003. Beheim had intended to retire in 2018, but the departure of the expected successor, Mike Hopkins, would keep him at Syracuse. And lucky it did, because during the 21-22 season, Beheim coached both his sons, Jimmy and Buddy Beheim. I mean, what a storybook career. The entire thing at one school, his school. He coached his kids, won a title. He did finish it out, missing the postseason twice in a row, a losing season in 22, and a 10 and 10 ACC finish and no postseason in 23. But even after those two losing seasons at the end, it seems like his plan in 2018 to hand it off to a successor that he felt worthy didn't work out, but I think he has that now in 2023. With Beheim finally stepping down, longtime assistant, Adrian Autry has been named as the head coach. He's been with the program since 2011 and has been an associate head coach since 2016. Autry played for Beheim in the 90s, and after a 10-year career in the European leagues, he retired from playing the game of basketball and got into coaching. In fact, in 2012, he was named the fifth best assistant coach by ESPN and was noted for his strong recruiting ties in the DC and DMV area. As an assistant coach at Syracuse, he coached forwards and recruited all positions, where he worked closely with many future NBA picks. Autry is described as a no-flash, all-substance guy, but with new coaches, we certainly have questions. We expect Autry will employ Syracuse's famed 2-3 zone, but the question is, how much zone versus how much man will he play? He's kept the answer really close to his vest since taking the helm, but based on his comments in the offseason, both zone and man will be part of the defensive strategy. Interestingly enough, the 23-24 Syracuse roster appears to be built for that 2-3 zone Syracuse is known to run. But if you look at it, the height, length, and athleticism could certainly translate very well to man defense. Beheim's offense was built around giving the most skilled players offensive freedom with the ball, exploiting mismatches. But will we see more offensive intervention with Autry? If he plans to play tempo, like he vocalized in his press conference, he certainly built the roster in the offseason capable of playing in transition, with depth to back it up. As modern basketball becomes more positionless, Autry tailored the roster with tall, athletic, skilled guards capable of playing either guard slot to complement his fleet of versatile forwards. This could be a roster built for rebounding and transition offense. But what will the half court's offense look like? Along those lines, how does the late game offense unfold? Beheim kept it simple. His approach involved getting the ball into the hands of his best player and letting them make a play. But overall, does Autry breathe new life into the offense? Perhaps we see something that resembles a modern offensive philosophy in college basketball. Basically, at this point, we have a lot more questions than answers. And until we see the orange on the court, we won't really be able to answer them. So what do we know for the 23-24 season? We know Autry was able to retain both assistant coaches and made a new hire in Brendan Strong. Autry managed to keep the entire 2022 freshman class intact and return for their sophomore season, 
which is no small feat in today's game. The only blunder this offseason was the inability to retain Jesse Edwards for a fifth year, but the Syracuse staff did an excellent job addressing their needs in the transfer portal. So first, the big exit. Senior center Jesse Edwards, an all-ACC performer for the 22-23 campaign, transferred to West Virginia. Replacing his production and presence on both ends of the floor will prove to be a huge challenge. Senior shooting guard Joe Gerard III transferred to fellow Atlantic Coast Conference squad Clemson. Gerard led Syracuse in scoring last season, and Syracuse basketball went 17 and 15 overall. Some fans think he was a defensive liability, but there's no denying that looking ahead at the 23-24, two of the Orange's top three scorers are gone. Additionally, senior reserve guard Samir Torrance transferred to Binghamton, and Richard junior reserve forward John Bull Ajak is also currently in the transfer. For portal. So if you look ahead to the roster for next year, in the backcourt, Syracuse will have sophomore guard Judah Mintz. He was a starter as a freshman. He made the all-freshman team, averaging 16.3 points, 4.6 assists, and 1.8 steals per game. After the season, Mintz declared for the NBA draft while maintaining his eligibility. He ultimately withdrew his name from the draft and opted to return to Syracuse for his sophomore year. He's the leader. He's the second leading scorer from last year. He's the leading returning scorer. He played the most minutes. Despite having only played one year, Mintz has more career starts than any other player on this Syracuse roster. Mintz led the ACC in steals last season, but Autry thinks Mintz can be even more disruptive on the defensive end as the Orange incorporate more man-to-man -man defense. Next, sophomore guard slash small forward, 6'6", six six, Justin Taylor returns. He played in 29 games last season with two starts, averaging 16.7 minutes on the year. He was a 39.3% shooter from beyond the arc and added 17 steals on the year. Offensively, He's skilled and smart. His biggest strength relies on his ability to make shots from three. He's a little bit of a throwback in that he likes to come off screens. He's got a very high release so he can get a shot off with little separation. He's a good passer in terms of feeding the post and keeping the ball moving and finding the open man. He's a good defender and rebounder. This man has been working on this since he was 12 years old and saw his sister preparing to go play in college. And he jumped right into the gym with her personal trainer and has been pushing himself to the limit ever since. After reading his story, I truly expect him to improve even more going into next season and maybe even push for a starting spot. Sophomore guard Kadir Copeland, a 6'6", 200-pound guy, came off the bench for 20 games last season. Now his freshman year, while he shot free throws at 86%, he went 1 from 9 from beyond the arc for 11% three-point percentage. I know that's a low volume, but maybe he was nervous to take more shots when he started missing them. I'm not sure I didn't watch enough Syracuse games to know what the full story was there. Now the six foot six versatile guard, who doubles as a small forward, does provide enthusiasm for his teammates when he's on the bench. Syracuse fans have been quick to notice how animated he has been from the sideline, and they've appreciated his contributions and hustle when he gets the opportunity to play. His shooting has improved. Even though he plays the one, two, or three, right now he can play the three. He's active there. He rebounds as well as anyone else. He has the ability to put it on the floor better than most. Even when he didn't play at all, he was talking to people in huddles at halftime, talking to his teammates. He understood the game. He has a good knowledge for the game. He's encouraging guys to play. This guy sounds like a great glue guy. It would be good to see him improve and get more time, but if nothing else, he's going to be the hypest hype man on the bench. Redshirt sophomore guard Kyle Cuff Jr. transferred in from Kansas. He played in two games during the 22-23 season after redshirting for KU's national title campaign going into his freshman year. Practice with the team the entire 21-22 season, he didn't see the court, and unfortunately this past season, he suffered a torn MCL and PCL in his knee during a mid-November workout and was unable to practice or play the rest of the season. In that preseason really get to see him play Kansas. I had to look back at what he did in high school, even though he's coming in as a sophomore. He came out of high school, he was a tad undersized for a scoring or shooting guard, but he's extremely explosive as an athlete. He made a myriad of plays on the defensive end and is a major threat finishing at the rim in transition. He excels in a fast, open game, much more than a slower, constricted game. Loves to get to the rim as a slasher, Finishes with either hand against contact Shooting guards. You can put him on wings. If he comes back 100% from the knee, he's going to raise the roof in the zone potential as a shooter. A playmaker primarily for himself, he has the room to improve as a distributor. He's a strong rebounder for his position and can be a tear on the defensive end with his explosive athleticism. 
We'll see if he comes in fully rehabbed and what he can do. Percent from the floor and 34.5% from beyond the arc. He only grabbed four or more boards in three games and was often pulled early due to defensive lapses. Because of his shooting prowess, Bell is one of the many candidates to make the switch to the guard room full time. Because of his natural six foot seven height, it may make sense to keep Bell in the front court though, but positions in general are up in the air until Autry reveals his offensive and defensive strategies for the first time in November. If Bell shows improvement defensively, and on the glass, he stands a great chance to retain his starting lineup position next season. Six foot eight sophomore forward Malik Brown returns after playing 29 games last season, starting in seven of them. Brown keeps his game mostly inside, where he shoots 70%, but he shoots 50% from the free throw line which is worrisome. He's that four man that comes in and gives energy, rebounds the ball. He's on top of the press, he uses his length to get steals and to generally disrupt things on defense. Given Brown's frame and wingspan, Brown was built for the Orange's 2-3 zone. He's a glue guy who found more minutes at the end of the season. I'd expect him to find a bigger role at the start of the coming year if he keeps improving. Six foot eight junior forward Benny Williams comes back after what had been an up and down sophomore season, but his tools and flashes as a six foot eight big wing remain compelling. Teams are always searching for size and shot making, and at six foot eight, 206 pounds, Williams showcased his ability to knock down with some splashes of versatility. He'll knock down threes, triples off the catch and shoot, along with movement mid-range jumper, although it's fairly small volume with 39% from deep this season. He is excellent at leveraging his size, length, and athleticism to make plays on and off the ball, not only resulting in stops, but scores for Syracuse on multiple occasions. His upside, a disruptive and switchable defender as a big wing, fits right into the NBA. Consistently hunting offensive rebounds, this type of activity and spirit is another way Williams can impact the game without needing the ball in his hands. Taking advantage of second chance opportunities for your team can demoralize opposing teams, especially in critical situations. It would be safe to assume that he'll see the court even more next year and impact games at a greater level. Six foot 11 sophomore, Peter Carey returns after only playing three games last year before being sidelined with a lower body injury. He can apply for a medical redshirt to preserve his freshman year and have four years of college basketball eligibility remaining. He's expected to play center during his Syracuse career, although he believes he at some point could be suited for a stretch four. He's gotten to a point where he can step out and hit the three. Carey might fit better on the wing for Syracuse if he can add strength and develop some offensive moves outside of dunks and lobs. He could emerge as a nice piece. Carey's an intriguing long-term project, but fans might want to temper their expectations. He was already a project before the knee injury. He was already a project before the knee injury, and we're not sure what we're getting next year. Six foot eleven redshirt junior center Monir Hima played 27 games after transferring in last season. There is a match between him as frame and Syracuse's 2-3 zone. It was a no-brainer for him to come here. His story of how he went from Niger to the U.S. alone in 2017 with little basketball knowledge to now playing for Syracuse is wild. He's been working to improve finishing around the basket, along with positioning and defensive rotations. The scoring will come. I'd expect to see improvements going into next year. The only incoming freshman is 7 foot 2, 220 pounds center, William Patterson. He's hoping to add 10 to 15 pounds by June and then get into summer school where he can start working with the nutritionists and training staff to really put on weight and see if he can contribute this season. Though he'll come in a bit raw, Patterson's size should allow him a good chance to develop and succeed against, against a physical ACC. And finally, 7 foot 4 transfer from FSU, Naheem McLeod. McLeod spent the last two seasons in Tallahassee this past season, he averaged 4.5 points, 2.7 rebounds, and 1.2 blocks in just over 13 minutes per game. He scored a career-high 16 points against Syracuse on February 8th. McLeod presents problems for his opponents simply due to his size. Standing at 7'4", he'll prove to be a rim protector for Audrey, and hopefully 
a rebounding machine. At 7'4", he also becomes the tallest player in Syracuse history. McLeod has two years of eligibility remaining. After the season, the roster had a glaring need at center with the departure of Jesse Edwards. Syracuse lost its all-ACC starting center. Hopefully, they can replace that with McLeod or with William Patterson. So with this roster, it's expected that Autry will take advantage of the team's depth and athleticism and look to push the pace in games. This dovetails with playing less zone because tempo also has to account for the time that the opposing team takes to get a good shot. But a good man-to-man -man defense can make it tough for an opponent to find a good shot too. Mintz is also the most aggressive point guard Syracuse has had in years. I think Autry uses Mintz to rev up Syracuse transition game with the likes of J.J. Sterling, Chance Westry, Chris Bell, Benny Williams joining in the fun. Syracuse will play in this year's Maui Invitational. Syracuse has a 9-0 overall record in the Maui Invitational winning the entire event in 1990, 98, and 2013. Syracuse is the only team with an undefeated record in Maui, so it will be interesting to see what they do there and if they can keep that streak alive. As for postseason expectations, after missing the last two years, I'm not really sure. I think the talent is all there, and we've seen at UNC and Duke, when a legendary coach retires, the team usually goes on a good run that first year. So it's possible we see Syracuse back in the NCAA. But there's really no telling what we see until we know what system they're running, how the team fits in that system, how they come together, and how they've improved in the offseason. It's really just a guessing game at this point. The talent is certainly there. They have the potential. Can they put it together? All that said, the Curry Dome should be a really good place to be this fall, and Syracuse fans do have reason to be excited. I just wouldn't go around touting a national title contender yet.